Please remain standing, and I'm going to pray. Bow your head and pray with me. Father, what a privilege to be able to even pour out our heart to you in song before we hear from your word, and we, we do ask that you would speak to us. Um, we, don't, we don't want to make the mistake of, of thinking that you do not speak until, until there is a subjective or existential moment where our emotions and our experience are ignited that you have not spoken until we have such an experience. We, we, we sing this song and we make this our prayer, Lord, because we know that you have written and every time we look at your word, you speak. And so, Lord, this morning as we look, our, we look at your word and we direct our attention to the infallible, inspired word that you have spoken, the Bible, this written record of your heart and mind. It's a written record that is unchanging and transcendent and outside of us and uh, beyond our, our comprehension in the sense that we could never overtake it and comprehend it and categorize it sufficiently. But it is knowable that we could actually learn your heart and learn your mind and, and know you. It's, it's living and active. So though it does not change, because for it to change would become less than it is, it's, it's perfect and unimprovable, but it's still living and dynamic. It's active. It, it pursues us. It takes hold of us. It confronts us. It convicts us. It shows us your glory to degrees we have not yet seen. It shows us our need to degrees that we have not yet seen. And so we sing this song with, with that in mind, Lord. We come before you asking you to, that when you speak this morning, as we look at what you said in Mark chapter 4, that our hearts would be soft, that our hearts would be filled with faith. And Lord, we, we pray even now as a congregation because corporately, Lord, we recognize our need. Corporately, we have needs. Individually, we have needs. And we come to you for the grace that we so richly need in this moment so that we would hear your word and hear it rightly with a proper response. And so please help us to submit our hearts, to embrace your truth as the authority over our lives, to submit to it, and to not rest until by your grace we see fruit produced from your word. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Well, I want to invite you to grab your Bible and open up to Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4, we're... We're in this passage that starts in chapter 4, verse 1, all the way through chapter 4, verse 20, and it's known as the, the parable of the sower, uh, and it's better to be known as the parable of the soils. And um, as you're turning there, I, I just want to kind of introduce this by way of something that uh, happens every year. Here we are, at, uh, we've just finished Christmas season, we're coming up on New Year's, and in our country, we have a rich tradition for, for many years and for many presidencies now that at the beginning of the year, the president would give to the Congress a State of the Union address. And so that's going to be coming up, I would assume, shortly. The State of the Union is usually uh, evaluated and um, identified on the basis of certain specific factors. It could be the, the gross domestic product or employment versus unemployment. It could involve the confidence in the economy based on Wall Street. Uh, it could be a state of education. Um, and even in more recent addresses to the Congress, um, the virtue of our society has been signaled by how well we maintain civil protections for those who self-identify themselves by their chosen form of rebellion against God. And so that's the State of the Union 
the state of the United States, how are we doing as a country? And so the State of the Union is given, and there it is, an, an evaluation, an evaluation of, of, of a society, uh, the country that we live in and have known and loved. The success or the evaluation of anything, be it a nation or a, uh, a person's uh, work in their own employment, the, the, the evaluation of that is determined by, by well, how well we accomplish our purpose. That's really the only way to evaluate something as to uh, whether it's doing well or doing poorly is how well is it accomplishing its purpose. There's a few examples of this that would be every day. If I were to evaluate um, my vehicle, how do I evaluate my vehicle? If I were to evaluate my vehicle merely on the comfort of the seats and how efficient the air conditioning is, you know, you might have a nice kind of living room out in the garage that when it gets too hot in the house you can go out and sit in the garage and sit in your car and turn on the ac and you'd say man, that's a great car but it doesn't run it doesn't drive but man the ac and the seats are so comfortable and so so comfortable so cool you obviously don't evaluate a book by the size of the the footnote font or the quality of the paper and the binding you, you evaluate it according to the content we don't evaluate um a tradesman by how well they wrote their estimate, you look at an estimate and say, man, that's incredible handwriting. It looks like the Constitution. I think they used a calligraphy nib on this one. And then they walk away from the job site and you're, you have plumbing leaks and you've got mold growing in your living room and everything else. And you think, okay, man, I'm a great plumber. I mean, I love the estimate, but uh, left a little bit to be desired. Well, in this passage in Mark chapter four, it's not the state of the country. It's not the state of the union. It's, it's not an evaluation of people, jobs, tools. It's an evaluation of the heart. It's an evaluation of the heart, an evaluation of the human heart. A couple of weeks ago, we looked at this parable of the soils, and we, we, we really focused on the, uh, the first 12 verses and looked at the purpose of parables, and we saw that the purpose of parables is twofold. Number one, to reveal mysteries to the insider, to those who are following after Christ, who are believing Christ, who are cherishing his word, it reveals mysteries to them. But on the other hand, the purpose of parables is to actually conceal mysteries from the outsider. And so both of those purposes are, are in play here. But when we get to verse 13 of Mark chapter 4, Jesus begins to explain a parable, and this really is the state of the heart address. Jesus, in these verses, are, he's explaining the purpose of the parable of the soils, which he gave in verses 3 through 9. And in that parable, he gives a story of a sower sowing seed and how the seed responds differently because there's four different types of soil, and so there's four different and distinct results when the seed lands in those four distinct types of soils. So now Jesus begins to explain that parable, and it's a state of the heart. The state of the heart is everything. Jesus is not giving the state of his heart. He's giving the state of his listeners' hearts. It's the state of our hearts. Our hearts are exposed in the explanation of this parable from verses 13 to 20. And there's, there's four. There's four soils, and so there's four types of hearts. When it comes to an evaluation of our hearts, the question becomes, what's the purpose? What's the purpose? There could be no greater estimation or evaluation of your heart than by this single criteria. How well do you listen to the word of God? You cannot make it more simple than that. A.W. Tozer said it this way. He said, the most important thing about a man is what he thinks of God. Your thoughts of God are the most important thing about you. And I would add from Mark chapter 4, if we assume, as it, the scriptures so clearly say, that you could not possibly know God infallibly except from his word, then we should also add from Mark 4 that the most important thing about your heart is how well you listen to God's word. How well do you hear God's word? How well do you submit to God's word? How well do you put it into practice? That becomes the, the test, the litmus test of the state of our hearts. There's nothing more important about you than 
How do you listen? How do you hear? How well do you listen to God's word? I want to begin just by reading our story. Our, our, the, the parable is, again, it occurs in verses 3 to 9, then in verses 10 to 12, the purpose of parables, and then finally the explanation of this first parable in verses 13 to 20. And so as we looked at last time, we looked a little bit more in detail from verses 1 to 12. This morning, we're going to look, uh, Lord willing, more in detail at verses 13 to 20. But I want to read all of the story here, verse 1 through verse 20. So follow along as I go back and read this narrative. Starting in verse 1, Mark writes, He began to teach again by the sea, and such a very large crowd gathered to him that he got into a boat in the sea and sat down, and the whole crowd was by the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables, and he was saying to them in his teaching, Listen to this. Behold, the sower went out to sow. As he was sowing, some seed fell beside the road, and the birds came and ate it up. Other seed fell on the rocky ground where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up because it had no depth of soil. And after the sun had risen, it was scorched, and because it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among the thorns, and the thorns came up and choked it, and it yielded no crop. Other seeds fell into the good soil, and as they grew up and increased, they yielded a crop and produced 30, 60, and 100-fold. And he was saying, He who has ears to hear, he must hear. As soon as he was alone, his followers, along with the twelve, began asking him about the parables. And he was saying to them, To you has been given the mystery of the kingdom of God, but those who are outside get everything in parables. So that while seeing, they may see and not perceive. And while hearing, they may hear and not understand. Otherwise, they might return and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. These are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown, and when they hear, immediately Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. In a similar way, these are the ones on whom seed was sown on the rocky places, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. And they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. Then, when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. These are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke out the word and it becomes unfruitful. And those are the ones on whom the seed was sown on good soil. And they hear the word and accept it and bear fruit. 30, 60, and 100 fold. As I mentioned last time, this becomes a turning point in Jesus' ministry. If you skip down to verses um, 33 and 34, Mark explains that with many such parables, he was speaking the word to them so far as they were able to hear it, and he did not speak to them without a parable, but he was explaining everything privately to his own disciples. So we find out that even though in verses 3 through 9 we hear the parable of the soils, as it was told to the masses, the explanation in verses 13 to 20 would have only been given to the disciples in private. In fact, Because of the massive rejection of Christ's teaching from chapters 1 through 3, for him to start speaking in parables at this point is a a demonstration of judicial hardening that not only prevents those who refuse to listen from hearing more truth, it also spares them from even more severe judgment because they are already rejecting the truth. 
but he wants to continue speaking truth so that he can make more truth known to those who are following him, and so he continues to speak in parables. So now, the masses did not hear verses 13 to 20. What we're studying this morning is really words of Christ for those who are on the inside. I, in the mystery of God's providence, he just calls us to just scatter far and wide. And I thought about that. The fact that I'm sitting here trying to preach a text that Christ gave to those who were on the inside. It was the 12 and all of those who were following him. It was obviously broader than the 12, as is clear from our passage. But I thought about it, and I thought, you know, I just want to begin by asking you to consider if, if, you're, if you're not on the inside, which means if you are not currently listening to God's word, you're not submitting your heart, your inner man to God's word, you're, you're about to be exposed to truth that the outsiders in Jesus' day did not even hear. And there's even a higher level of accountability to be exposed to this kind of truth. It's a privilege and an incredible, incredible liability if any one of us were to continue in a pattern that refused to listen. And so as we dive into the explanation, remember, this is privileged information, and we dare not listen if we are committed to not submitting. And I challenge you to look at this explanation of the parables and to identify and examine yourself. That's the intention of this explanation so that we can see what happens in our own heart, in our own soul, when the word of God is taught. What happens? My heart is being exposed when I hear God speak. How well do I listen? That becomes the important question for any one of us to examine as we look at this state of the heart address. Let's pick it up in verse 13. We're going to dive right in. Jesus says to them, do you not understand this parable? How will you understand all the parables? And there's insight and understanding that he wants to give to those who are on the inside. They've, they've followed him, and they have privately sought him out, and they've asked him, can you explain that to us? Can you explain this parable? And it's interesting that he hinges understanding of all the parables based upon this first parable. So there is a sense where this first parable, the parable of the soils, is actually a foundational parable, and it's critical for understanding all of the rest. In Mark chapter 4, we get three parables. In Matthew chapter 13, we get seven parables, and two of those are distinct from one another, so together there's actually eight, um, eight parables uh, between those two chapters, eight distinct parables. What's interesting is, is that in Mark's record, all three parables have seed. And so if we don't understand the parable of the soil sowing seed on four distinct types of soil, we actually won't be able to make sense of the rest. In fact, if you just look ahead where we're going, verse 26 to 29 is a parable of the farmer who, who, who scatters some seed and then goes to sleep and it grows crops while he's sleeping. The seed produces what it does, and it produces fruit automatically. Apart from the farmer's skill and effort, he just goes to sleep, and the seed produces. In verse 30 to 32, we see the parable of the mustard seed, which is a tiny, tiny seed, and it grows into this massive tree. And all three parables, the soil, the farmer, and the mustard seed, all have seed in the parable. So we couldn't make sense of any of these parables if we do not understand the identity of the seed. And so that's what Jesus is saying here in verse 13. And he puts it in such a way that he's impressing upon the disciples, do you have insight into this parable? I mean, in other words, he wants them to understand, and they ought to understand, they must understand. He who has ears to hear must hear. We must listen to this. So he begins the explanation in verse 13. 14. The sower sows the word. This is the only verse in the entire explanation about the sower, and even this verse is not actually about the sower. 
It does mention the sower, but the issue is not the identity of the sower, nor the skill of the sower. And so let me just press that home a little bit here as we think about the identity of this sower. Well, you could say it would be appropriate in the context to think of Jesus sowing the seed of God's word for three chapters. He's been preaching, he's making the teaching of God's word the preeminent, most notable aspect of his earthly ministry. And so here, for three chapters, we've been seeing Jesus scatter seed. He has been distributing the word of God for three chapters. And so if we think of Jesus as the sower, of course it would be right to imply the perfection in the scattering and the evenness of the spread and every distribution of God's word with perfection every time he's sowing. But that's not the point. We don't need to extrapolate the perfection of Jesus' evangelism. By way of contrast, when we think about our spreading of the seed, we often sense our inadequacy, our weakness. Ours isn't the professional, flawless skill of Jesus. Our, our experience as evangelists is probably more like, a, as, I, as I learned this uh, past October, uh, the difficulty of doing a winter lawn in Phoenix. And, uh, and I imagine how difficult that would be if we just said to our uh, elementary school-aged children, hey, this year you're doing the uh, winter lawn all by yourself. You know, you drag this big, massive bag of seed, you can't even get it, the kid can't even get it out of the driveway, and you're just dragging it, and man, let's just cut a little hole in it, make it a little lighter, so you just kind of start dragging it across the garage and across the apron, across the sidewalk, over the planter bed, across the pool patio, and then maybe across some dirt, and there's just seed going everywhere. And that's probably more akin to our ability of casting seed. But again, that's also extrapolation. Because notice, in the explanation of this parable, it's just identifying the sower is sowing the seed. The seed is the word of God. It doesn't, there's, there's no discussion about the skill of the sower. There's no distinction in the sower between the four types of soils. He's just sowing. And so the ability of the sower is completely beside the point. In fact, not only is it beside the point of the parable, it's beside the point in this verse. This verse is about the seed even more than the sower. The seed is the word, the word of God, the word of Christ, the scripture, his message. That's what's being sown. This is important to consider. The sower is the same to all four soils. The seed is the same for all four soils. This parable is not about people who don't hear the word of God. It's about people who hear the word of God and four distinct responses to the word of God. As we work through these four different soils, I want to challenge you Ask yourself this question. What's my habit when I hear the word? What's my habit? Any average week, any average morning that you read the scriptures, any average Sunday that you hear an equipping hour and a, a message and uh, an evening service, uh, and you hear a message of, from scripture and, and, and it, you hear a download while you're working or while you're driving and you, you hear the scripture explained or you read it for yourself or, or you read someone else's explanation of a passage of scripture, just grab any average exposure to the word of God and ask yourself, what is your habit? What's your default mode when it comes to your listening to the scriptures? That's the question we've got to ask because that's the question this parable will answer for us. There's four soils, and he starts explaining the soils in verse 15, and this has been often called the hard heart. This soil is the hard heart, and I give you a description here. I think the description is helpful because this is a description of the heart that is exposed to the word, but is indifferent to the word. Exposed, but indifferent. Look at verse 15. Picking up on the parable that he said about seed being thrown onto a hard path and the bird grabbing it out of the path, he says, these are the ones who are beside the road where the word is sown. And when they hear, immediately 
Satan comes and takes away the word which has been sown in them. So the bird, the equivalent of the bird taking away the seed in the parable version, in the explanation, that's nothing less than Satan himself. Satan is eager to grab the word and remove it from the heart in such a fashion that it never has time to take root, to take effect. Think about the deceptiveness of Satan and his demons. There were undoubtedly sinners in Jesus' earthly ministry who were possessed by demons whom Jesus personally delivered from possession while at the same time Satan was snatching the word from their ears. What an incredible tactic. Demon possession, here comes Christ, delivers them. Wow, that's great. I'm free of the demon. And meanwhile, Satan's just plucking the meaning of the scriptures from their hearts so that they do not respond. The issue with this soil is that the heart is not soft. It remains impenetrable in spite of the exposure to the truth. Think about it. Satan's only tactic is not to keep people ignorant of the word. If his only tactic was to keep people ignorant of the word, he has failed miserably. He is much more wily than that, much more subtle than that, much more sophisticated than that. He is completely comfortable with people being exposed to the word so long as he can pluck it out of their heart, so long as they remain indifferent, so long as their hearts remain hard. He could care less whether people are exposed. You've probably heard of the missionary Jim Elliott, famous missionary who was martyred in January of 1556 on the Curare River, killed by the Aka Indians of, in Ecuador. On November 6th, 1955, two months before he was martyred, he wrote this in his journal. You wonder why people choose fields away from the states when young people at home are drifting? I'll tell you why I left. Because those stateside young people have every opportunity to study here and understand the word of God in their own language. And these Indians have no opportunity whatsoever. And I'll explain, if you're not familiar with the story of Jim Elliot, he studied at Wheaton, he went back home to Oregon, and his church in Oregon wanted him to become a youth pastor. And he said, I'm not staying here to teach, teach our youth who already have access to the word of God. There's, in, there's, there's tribes in, in Ecuador who haven't even heard the word of God. I've got to go. And so he says this, and the Indians that he's speaking about here are not the Aka Indians. He's only seen them from a plane at this point in his life. He's been ministering to um, some Indians uh, in, in Quicha, a town in Ecuador. Um, and so he's already, been, he's already learned their language and he's sharing the gospel with them. He said, I ha I've had to make a cross of two logs and lie down on it to show the Indians what it means to crucify a man. When there is that much ignorance over here, and so much knowledge and opportunity over there, speaking of the states, I have no question in my mind why God sent me here. Those whimpering stateside young people will wake up on the day of judgment condemned to worse fates than these demon-fearing Indians because having a Bible, they were bored with it. while these never heard of such a thing as writing. What an indictment. He said in his journal, he said it's just tragic to think of teenagers in, back in Oregon with Bibles collecting dust on their shelves, and these have never heard. Satan's Satan's not concerned about exposure so much as he is about soft heart. There's something he's more concerned about than the exposure to the Bible, and that would be having a soft heart that would actually believe the Bible. Listener, did you hearing Christ explain his parable? Let me ask you, what is Satan's greatest tactic for keeping you from benefiting or profiting from the word? What's your, what's your habit? 
Is there, a, is there a hard-heartedness? Is there an indifference? Is there a mechanism? Is there some sort of pathway of habitual listening that gets you out from under the impact of the scriptures when you hear it taught? It's important for you to identify that. Do you, do you just habitually disregard the, the word as soon as the sermon is over? And you never, never have to go back to it, never a, a passing glance. I've seen that Typified. I remember one young man that I poured into, I discipled, and I was trying to share the gospel with and evangelize, and he, he made a profession of faith, but every single time he would hear a sermon, he would just, his default mechanism was just to go home and just binge on Netflix. He just watched, he just started absorbing entertainment. I mean, he was there Every Sunday, every Sunday morning, every Sunday night. We have Bible study on Thursday night. He was there every time the Word of God was being opened, but his habit was to just dismiss the impact of the Word of God. He had an out. Maybe it's just a habitual distraction. Maybe your regular pattern is, maybe your habitual pattern after Sunday is, involves um, sports or lunch preparation or relaxation or responsibilities, preparing for the week. And, and, and some of those things are incredibly important and very valuable aspects of a, of a week to be a faithful employee, a faithful uh, dad and a faithful mom. And those can also be incredible habits for indifference to the Word of God. Before we can even evaluate our hearts and evaluate whether we bear fruit, we have to ask ourselves, do we even pay attention to the scriptures? Are we even familiar with the word? So before we would even ask the question, do I obey God's commandments? Do I even know God's commandments? I remember asking a friend one time, I, I said, hey, can you just tell me 20, 20 commands that God's given you, 20 binding imperatives on your life? from the God who created you, who wrote the Bible. Give me 20 out of the thousand in the scriptures. Just give me 20 that are binding on your life. And he mentioned later, he said that was extremely convicting for him because he knew he couldn't even list out 20 obligations on his life. And so the question would then be, how could I even imagine I'm, I, I'm listening to the word well when I don't even know what it, ha what it has to say? As Satan snatching it out of my heart before it could even take root. And of course, some of you have a mind that you could, you could quote 20 books of the Bible cover to cover. And so that's not everything. I mean, the question is, do we obey it? But we do have to know it. We do have to know it. What's your habit? Is there a habit that would perpetrate hard-heartedness, that would prevent, it would continue to nurse in your response to the scriptures a hard heart? That's the first type of soil. In verses 16 and 17, we see the second type of soil. And this is, this is a type of soil that I'm going to describe as joyful but superficial. The response to, this, to the seed here is, in this heart is, is a joyful response. So it's not negative like the, the hard-hearted response where there's just an indifference. It just goes off without a bang. This is actually a response that goes off with a lot of fanfare. It goes off with a, with a flash. There's, a, there's a, an incredibly warm response, but it's superficial. Verse 16, in the, in the similar way, these are the ones on whom the seed was sown in the rocky places, who, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. I mean, this is interesting how I, I saw this in my own, my own yard here in Phoenix. Uh, yeah, I scattered some of the seed, and there's a, I have a little planter bed where there's rock on one side and dirt on the other, and seed go, goes on both sides of the divider. And sure enough, in the rocky soil, in the, in the little rock bed, some grass grew up. And if you go to my house right now, there, you can still find some grass in the rock bed, but a minuscule fraction of it. Why is it still there? Because it's only the section that is currently still under the shade of a tree all day long. Everywhere, what grew up in the rocks, well, it, it, it died as soon as the sun started beating down on it. It was almost like Jesus knew what he was talking about. It was incredible. Just picture this very thing right here. 
This is the person who they hear the, the, the word, and it's not an indifferent response. Notice verse 16b, when they hear the word, immediately receive it with joy. There's a, there's a thrill. There's a, there's, a, there's a joy about it. Now, there, there's nothing wrong with joy. Joseph Aline rightly said, a convert that lacks either joy or convi- conviction is suspect. So a conversion without joy or conviction of sin, something's wrong. There should be both. But the issue here is not the presence of the joy. It's the absence of the lifelong conviction. Notice, it's immediately received with joy. And this word receive is an important word. I'm going to basically introduce a conversation we're about to have when we get to verse 20. But go to verse 20. In verse 20, when Jesus says, and on the good soil, he says, these are those on whom the seed was sown on the good soil. They hear the word and accept it. When we get to verse 20, I'm going to make a comment about the difference between receiving and accepting. But for now, just understand that even though there's a difference, and maybe if you say accepting some, uh, or receiving something and welcoming it, that might even bring out, accentuate the difference there. The issue here is there's actual possession They've actually taken the word of God and they have it in their possession. And they take it into their possession with joy. Wow, this is great. What an incredible message. They hear Jesus' teaching. They hear the gospel. You come into someone's life and and your friend who's living in darkness hears truth. And they say, wow, that's incredible. Forgiveness of sin? Eternity with God? All of my guilt? taken care of by Christ, and he gives me righteousness? Incredible. What incredible news. It's the best thing I've ever heard. Verse 17 continues, and they have no firm root in themselves, but are only temporary. And then when affliction or persecution arises because of the word, immediately they fall away. The word fall away here is scandalizo, where we get our word scandal from, to be scandalized. It's often translated as to, to be caused to sin or to stumble. Um, and here, it's actually being referred to in the context of catching somebody or tripping them, and it renders their discipleship ineffective. And one commentator said, here the focus is not on the sin, but on the apostasy under pressure. The issue is, is that they, they, they had a positive response. It was warmly received, with joy even. And now, here comes the first trial of testing. Affliction or persecution comes, and the person falls away. They stumble. And so, last year's positive response to the word, two years ago's warmth, Conviction and joy is, starts to subside, and dimmer, and dim and fade, and they fall away. This word uh, to stumble, to fall away, is used of the disciples in Mark chapter 14, 27. Jesus says, you're all going to fall away. And um, 14, 29, two verses later, Peter says, I won't. <laughs> And then, of course, he does. Well, Jesus is using it there in a temporal sense because they fall away and they stumble. But in this context, there's nothing to indicate that this falling away is temporal. It certainly could be permanent. But the point is is that we wouldn't know. Who could possibly know that? to be smug and complacent about last year's passion about God's word while currently not listening to God's word is a presumption that we cannot dare make. You might think, Jesus, are you saying, in your explanation of this parable, Jesus, are you telling me that if I respond poorly to God's word, it might be my last opportunity? That's possible. We couldn't know. If you've responded poorly to God's word in the past, is it over? No, by God's grace you're here and you're, you're hearing Jesus explain his parable so that you can take inventory and look at your heart and say, man, I have not responded to God's word rightly. But we dare not presume that because we've 
listened poorly and God maybe brought back a sense of warm response to God's word that we can just say, okay, good. I can always have that outlet. I can always, when I want to, I can choose to go back to responding to the word the way it ought to be responded to. No. No. Watch out for the joyful but superficial heart. Response to God's word that falls away at persecution. In the English Reformation, there was a bishop of Salisbury in uh, England. His name was Nicholas Shaxton. He had to resign from his office because Henry passed some articles that would have prevented any true Bible-believing Christian from functioning in the Anglican church. So he resigned, and they threw him in prison because he was believing in what would have been called Lutheranism, or what we would call Protestantism. He was thrown in prison because of his views on the sacrament and the Lord's Supper, and he was condemned to be burned alive for his heresy. The bishops of uh, London and Worcester uh, were sent by the king, and they visited him while he was in uh, the tower, and uh, they kept pleading with him to recant. And finally... Shaxton, being weak, finally recanted of his views and then thanked the king, quote, for that he had delivered him at the same time from the temporal and from the everlasting fire. So he repented of his biblical views to go back to a more Catholic view and then thanked the king for delivering him from the temporal fire of England and the eternal fire of hell is what he's saying. On July 13, 1546, he was set at liberty. And as he started to grow old, his understanding of the word and his ability to listen to the word grew less and less and less. Fast forward 10 years. Under Queen Mary, bloody Queen Mary, who killed approximately anywhere from 250 to 400 Protestants for their views, he was one of the most eager religious officials to see Protestants burned. Here's a man who knew the truth, went to jail for the truth, but his response to the word was joyful but superficial. Temporal, didn't last. When the sun started to beat down on him, he fell away. If the first soil is a hard heart, it's exposed to the truth but indifferent to the truth. The second soil is superficial. It's joyful when it hears the word of God, but its, its response is not um, long-standing. It's short. It, 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 it's uh, consumed quickly. Well, the third soil in verses 18 and 19 has a significant response, but it's short-lived. And we could say that this third soil is distracted. The third soil is distracted. Look at what Jesus says in verses 18 and 19. And others are the ones on whom seed was sown among the thorns. And these are the ones who have heard the word, but the worries of the world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it becomes unfruitful. This is a significant response. This is a, seems to be, as in distinction from the second soil, a kind of response to the word that actually would outlive some sort of, some sort of testing, some sort of um, suffering or persecution. But here, this is not the shallow soil that grows up quickly and uh, then falls away when the sun hits it. This is one that has a more robust response, but it's growing up among thorns, the thorns which choke out the plant in the parable are equal to, in real life, verse 19, the worries of the world, the deceitfulness of riches, and the desire for other things. And so if we want to understand what's going on with this third soil, we've got to look at these descriptions. And we've got to ask ourselves, what about this soil would we see in our own heart naturally? Verse 19 says, first of all, the worries of the world. Worries are the cares, the concerns, and the burdens of this life. Inevitably, this life is hardwired with 
burdens and cares and concerns and even responsibilities. And many of them are God-given. So this is not an indictment against all responsibility, all cares, all concerns, or all burdens. It would be um, appropriate to remind ourselves of the fact that Jesus gives us responsibilities, he gives us roles, he gives us obligations, he gives us things that we must be concerned about. There are certain responsibilities that if we were unconcerned about, we would be utterly unfaithful. There are certain concerns that a husband must have for a wife or he would be unfaithful as a Christian husband. There are certain concerns that parents must have for children or they would be negligent, if not unfaithful, as parents. So this is not an indictment against all cares, concerns, um, or burdens in this life. Responsibility is not, by definition, wrong. In fact, by definition, it's necessary. The issue here is that there are worries and concerns and burdens and obligations in this life that still can have the effect of choking out the word of God in our hearts. The question here ought to be how much responsibility do we take on? We can, we can actually take on responsibility and we can take on burdens and we can take on uh, certain obligations that become worries and anxieties and concerns for us that actually distract us from the word of God. For some of you, maybe this has even happened in the workplace without your even seeking it. And simply because you have been diligent at work and you've worked hard and you've made your employer more productive, efficient, profitable, whatever the case may be, you've been given more and more and more responsibility. Maybe you're even making a decision about, do I accept more responsibility for more pay? And that's a great question to ask. That's a question you should answer before the Lord. And that's, there's not necessarily a right or wrong, but there's certainly a right or wrong to the motives. A husband who's looking at a number of needs in his family and he's thinking about what it means to be faithful and he's thinking, Lord, it'd be great if you provided me a way to, to make more money to meet these needs. Well, that's, that's, that's great. The Lord provides an opportunity to make more money and yet it requires more responsibility. You're being faithful to do so. Great. Sometimes it it happens almost without your planning, and you feel like you're so consumed with worldly responsibilities that you don't even have a spare moment to think about the word. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you said no to earthly responsibilities simply to make sure that worldly concerns don't choke out the priority of hearing God's word well. I remember in, when I was in grad school, I remember how gracious the Lord was to stir me up. He stirred me up because I was thinking about things for a season there very, in a very worldly manner. And I was looking at how much, I had a wife and uh, not a lot of income, and uh, living at poverty level in L.A. County and um, thinking, man, this is, this is tough. And uh, okay, I got to make a living here. I got to provide. And I remember the Lord stirring me up about where's your heart? And he stirred me up about my use of finances. And I remember thinking at that time, man, I need to, I need to, I need to give. And, and I'm thinking like, what, what could I even give? And I, I, I had a, there was a missionary friend that I really liked what he was doing and he was church planting and overseas. And so I started giving him money and, and uh, it was such a measly, it was such an embarrassing amount. Like, I'm like, I don't even know if this is going to help him, the amount of correspondence. He's going to have to pay for stamps to write a thank you. And then it's going to be like, and now it's even out, you know? And every time he comes back, he'd give me a chocolate bar that was probably more than like six months of my giving. You know, I'm just thinking like, this is pathetic. But I knew, I knew my heart would not survive it. I knew my heart would not survive it. And so the Lord stirred me up to be giving. The Lord also stirred me up to think about eternity. And I started asking the question, well, how much do I actually need to, to provide for my own physical needs, my wife's physical needs, and to free me up to be as devoted with maximum effectiveness to training, to study the word of God for, for ministry? And I talked to my employer and said, hey, can I work for no more than 35 hours a week? He's like, you, you want to work more than 35? No, like le even less is fine. I, I can live on 32 to 35 hours a week. I was just like, we have cut it down to like the bare minimum. And if I can, if, if you're okay employing me with just that, with just 35 hours a week, then that frees me up to be devoted to these other things. 
And I remember how kind of foreign that felt. Never regretted it. Never regretted it. So thankful to the Lord for just changing my perspective to say, wait, why would you be accepting more worldly responsibilities, which could be a distraction from what ultimately matters? This is a significant but short-lived response to the word of God. Have you said no to worldly concerns, worldly responsibilities so that you can listen well to the word? It's an important question in light of verse 19. The worries of the world will choke out the word so that it becomes unfruitful in your heart. Secondly, notice Jesus also points out the deceitfulness of riches. The deceitfulness of riches. Now, I'll be honest. I marched into verse 19 this week, kind of imagining, having you know, even studied this verse before, and just imagining, yep, I, I know what that is. I, I, I know exactly what's here. I know what, I know what I'm going to find. And I was, of course, shocked and uh, even so refreshed at a newer discovery. I was looking at this word, deceitfulness. This is a warning against, as one commentator says it, the seduction that comes from affluence with its illusion of security. And as I was looking at this word, the word deceitfulness can also mean illusion. It can even mean the pleasure of the illusion. And so when I saw in a couple of different dictionaries for this Greek word, a couple of different lexicons and theological dictionaries, I saw the entry deceitfulness and then number two, pleasure. And I'm like, well, what? okay, those are distinct meanings. But then I saw how it was being used in a lot of, uh, in, in, some, in some Greek context, in some secular Greek texts, and it would be used, for instance, if you go to a play and you see a tragedy played out in front of you, and there is a, a, an illusion to what's being performed, and it's the pleasurable element of the illusion. I started to realize that is the meaning here. That's exactly what Jesus is talking about, is the pleasurable illusion. There's an entertainment value to riches. There's an entertainment value to riches that would actually cut you off from hearing the word of God because it would flatter you and think that you don't even need the word of God. It, it, it's an illusion. It's pleasurable to feel like I have control. I have freedom. I've got a nest egg. I can do as I please. I'm secure. And if that especially the love of money, regardless of whether you have it or not, the love of it, even without it, riches are still deceitful for people who don't even have it because there's a pleasurable illusion that goes with it that would cut off the word of God from having fruit in your life. In the 1930s, the most, one of the most famous living authors was William Somerset Mom, M-A-U-G-H-A-M. He was a playwright, um, novelist, short story writer. Um, he wrote a novel on human bondage, of human bondage that was a classic, and he wrote a play, um, The Constant Wife, that went through just multiple, multiple stagings. And he, lived in the, he was an Englishman, and he lived in the French Riviera. He was uh, extremely wealthy. He had an incredibly refined taste. He lived in a very fancy house on the Riviera. He was um, sexually very perverted. In 1965, at the age of 91, he was still incredibly rich, and um, he received 300 fan letters a week. And his nephew, Robin Mom, wrote a, an article in the, in the London Times that contained an excerpt about uh, William Somerset Mom's life. And here's what Robert, his nephew, said about it. I looked around the drawing room at the immensely valuable furniture and pictures of, and the objects that Willie's success had enabled him to acquire, acquire. I remembered the villa itself in the wonderful garden I could see through the windows, a fabulous setting on the edge of the Mediterranean, all worth 600,000 pounds. Again, this is in 1965. Willie had 11 servants, including his cook, Annette, who was the envy of all the other millionaires in the, on the Riviera. He dined off silver plates, waited on by Marius, his butler, and Henry, his footman, but it no longer meant anything to him. The following afternoon, I found Willie reclining on a sofa, peering through his spectacles at a Bible, which had very large print. He looked horribly wizened, and his face was grim. I've been reading the Bible you gave me, and I've come across the quotation, what shall it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? I must tell you, my dear Robin, that the text 
used to hang opposite my bed when I was a child. Of course, it's all a lot of bunk. But the thought, it's quite interesting all the same. Robin Mom went on to describe an empty, bitter old man who repeatedly fell into shrieking terrors and he would cry out, go away, I'm not ready, I'm not dead yet, I'm not ready to die, I tell you. Just the misery of a man who has been deluded by the deceitfulness, the pleasurable illusion of money. Do you view money as a resource to be used for the sake of eternity? Do you regard your finances as a means to maximizing your ability and others' ability to respond rightly to the word of God? Finally, Jesus says in verse 19, look at it. Number one, the worries of the world. Number two, the deceitfulness of riches. And number three, the desire for other things. Literally, this is lust. Lusts for the remaining things. Everything else, whatever's, whatever's left over. Lusts for all the rest. That's literally what Jesus is describing here. Whatever's outside the bounds of specific worries of the world, the, the worldly concerns, and the pleasurable illusion of riches, lust for all the other stuff goes with it. This could be self-love. This could be any form of worldliness, temporal mindedness, love of comfort. Those things cannot cohabitate in a heart with ears to hear. They're it's impossible. Those things will choke out a heart from hearing God's word rightly. William Roper was the son-in-law of the famous Thomas More. Thomas More, uh, um, you know, my, one of my sons just read his, his work, Utopia, and uh, had an interesting conversation with his professor, his teacher, about uh, Utopia as he critiqued it from a biblical perspective, and uh, his, his teacher was uh, shocked to even read, you know, that uh, Thomas More apparently didn't have a biblical view of man. And uh, so it was an interesting conversation. But Thomas More, famous for some of his literature in church history, is even more famous for his opposition to William Tyndale and dying as a Roman Catholic martyr. His son-in-law, William Roper, was influenced temporarily by Tyndale's New Testament, his arch enemy. He, he, T- Tyndale and More wrote against one another, and More was totally consumed with taking on Tyndale. He wrote, I think, over six volumes devoted to critiquing Tyndale and and, and proving that he was a heretic. Meanwhile, to his dismay, William Roper, his son-in-law, approaches him and um, asks for license to preach. And he's completely concerned because he knew that his son-in-law was was, uh, listening to, uh, reading the New Testament, listening to Tyndale's writings. He was reading them. And um, the historian says that this amiable and zealous young man came to his father-in-law one day and said to Sir Thomas, procure for me from the king, who is very fond of you, a license to preach. God has sent me to instruct the world. And the historian says that more was uneasy. Must this new doctrine, which he detested, spread even to his children? He exerted all his authority to destroy the work begun in Roper's heart. What? Said he with a smile. What, is it not sufficient that we are that, that uh, we are your friends, that we should know that you are a fool, but that you would proclaim your folly to the world? Hold your tongue. I will debate with you no longer. The young man's imagination had been struck, but his heart had not been changed. The discussions having ceased, the father's authority being restored, Roper became less fervent in his faith, and gradually he returned to Catholicism, of which he was afterwards a zealous champion. And that's exactly the way it goes. I mean, Jesus himself says in John chapter 5 that you cannot possibly love the praise of men and believe the word. Remember what he says in chapter 5, verses 43 and 44? I have come in my Father's name, and you do not receive me. If another comes in his own name, you will receive him. How can you believe? How can you believe? When you receive glory from one another, and you do not seek the glory that is from the one and only God. Seeking after the glory of men, lust for all the rest. Everything that could go in that category, it will choke off the word. Listen, the, the, the distracted heart is an idolatrous heart. 
The distracted heart can respond with significant response for a short season, but not for long. It's only a matter of time. There may be a significant response initially, but it will be short-lived, and the response to a distracted heart must be the prayer of Psalm 86, give me an undivided heart that I might fear your name. Finally, the last soil in verse 20, the good soil. This is a a soil that has a faithful and fruitful response. And look at verse 20. And those are the ones on whom the seed was sown on the good soil. They hear the word and accept it and bear fruit 30, 60, and 100 fold. Let me explain to you what's different about this soil. Notice that they hear it. Hearing the word is common to the first soil, the second soil, the third soil, and the fourth soil. What's distinct? It's that next verb. They accept it. They accept it. It's a different word than in verse, than in the second soil. Uh, in verse 16, uh, the second soil, the shallow heart, receives it with joy. And that's somebody who possesses the word of God. But this is somebody in the fourth soil, this is somebody who accepts the word of God. They welcome it. And there's a difference in between possession and exception, uh, accepting. And I'm going to show it to you. Theological, theological explanation comes in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. We've got we to gotta end this, but I, wanna, I don't want to end without showing you verse, verse 13. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13. Paul uses both of these words, and he uses both of these words in the same verse of the same people, namely the Thessalonians, in their response to the word of God. In verse 13, Paul writes, 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 13, For this reason, we also constantly thank God that when you receive the word, and there's the word received, that's the possession. They have possession of the word of God. They've been exposed to the message. They've been exposed to the meaning. They've had truth explained to them. When you received the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it. This means you welcomed it. So one is possession. The second one is the embracing. (laughs) This is the the cherishing of it, the the gripping of it with with, uh, acceptance. You welcomed it, not as the word of men, but for what it really is, the word of God, which also performs its work in you who believe. That's the issue. The issue here is when you accept the word of God, you welcome it as authoritative, you welcome it as divine, you welcome it as binding on your soul and on your conscience, and you are going to do whatever it calls you to do. When that soul hears the the word, when it's exposed to the seed, it produces fruit. And now think about this, because sometimes commentators get a little confused here, and they forgot that Jesus already explained the meaning of seed. And they get to verse 20, and it produces 30 and 60 and 100 fold, and they think, oh, it's good deeds. And in a general sense, yeah, that's, you could do that by way of implication. Or specifically, it's converts. And no doubt, that's going to be probably part of it, and maybe, imp- maybe even implied. But Jesus has already explained the seed. The seed is the word. When good soil hears the word and it's welcomed into the heart, of course there's going to be good works. Of course, there, in God's providence, there might be some converts. But the point is, is there's going to be an increasing exponential articulation and broadcasting of the truth. The word of God's going to flow out of that life in a powerful way. And that's what's produced in a soil that listens well. You might be thinking at the end of this explanation, man, what do I do if I'm not listening well? Well, unfortunately, I have to say that's for next time. (laughs) But I do want to point you to Mark chapter 4, verses 21 to 25. Jesus goes ahead, and we're going to look at this next time we have a chance to be in Mark. He's going to show us that it's going to be critical that we have a high standard of what it means to listen well. And if your life has recently not been characterized by listening well, The hope comes in verses 21 to 25 to take care, to watch out, to beware of how you listen, to have a high standard of what it means to listen well. And that's, he's going to correct our standard in verses 21 to 25. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this parable and thank you for the explanation. Lord, it's pretty sober to think that we just get to read Mark 4 whenever we want to. 
and we get to hear not only the public proclamation that you gave to that original audience, but you also, you also have given us the private explanation that you gave only to the insiders. And so, Lord, thank you so much for this truth. And I, I do pray that, Lord, it would not fall on deaf ears. I pray that if there are any who, whose hearts are hard or shallow or distracted, that you might stir them up by way of their lack of fruitful or faithful articulation and living out of the truth by, and faithful articulation of the truth. That would stir, stir us all up, Lord, to consider the importance of how we listen. Our heart is on display every time you speak, every time your word is opened. No wonder the apostle says, today, as long as it is called today, every time we hear you speak in your word, we need to look at one another and we need to examine, is there anyone among us with, a, with an evil, unbelieving heart? We must respond in faith. We must believe. We must welcome and accept this word as divine with all the authority that you possess. And so I pray, Lord, that we would have a proper standard and evaluation of what it means to listen and to listen well. And uh, Lord, thank you if we have seen our hearts respond to your word. We just want to thank you. As your children, we come before you this morning looking at this parable, thinking, it is only your grace, Lord, that your children would respond to your word. To see a positive response to truth that's tested by trial, that's proven in the face of responsibility and cares and concerns in this world, that's been tested by persecution. To see anyone here take your word and hang on to it, to let go of idols, to let go of comforts, to let go of an easier life, simply in order to respond rightly to your word. That is a grace. And so we thank you for it. Thank you so much for your goodness to us as your children. In your name we pray. Amen.